Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to CIO Leadership Live. I am your host for our conversation today, Mary Fran Johnson. It's delightful to have you here. And uh, we want to do a special welcome to all of our new live viewers on LinkedIn, which we just recently started streaming live to. We're also on Twitter and YouTube. And I'm going to be talking today with uh, David Bayen, who is the Vice President and CIO of Lazy Boy. And David joined Lazy Boy in June of 2017, bringing with him more than 15 years of progressive IT leadership and development experience in both the private and public sectors. Now, it's a public company with around $1.5 billion in annual revenue. Lazy Boy is based in Monroe, Michigan, and employs more than 9,000 people. It is the world's leading manufacturer of reclining chairs, which, of course, we all think of the brand associated by that, but it actually covers the whole home these days. It is one of America's largest producers of upholstered sofas and chairs and all the things that go with that, and it is sold both through distribution centers and at 350 retail stores nationwide. What David does at Lazy Boy is lead the IT and cybersecurity across the entire enterprise which is a task that involves aligning technology with Lazy Boy's business and its aggressive growth plans across the manufacturing and retail operations sectors. Before he came to this privately held company, the publicly held company, sorry, David spent six years as the CIO for the state of Michigan. He was a cabinet member for Governor Rick Snyder and director of the Department of Technology Management and Budget. And he's also a veteran of our own CIO perspective event stages. He has served as a keynote speaker, an expert panelist, and a moderator before national and international audiences. And he's also a member of our CIO Executive Council. So delightful to have you here today, David. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Now, as you noted, when we always like to start out our conversations talking, taking everybody up to that 30,000 foot view on the industry. So let's talk about disruption and what kind of an impact that is having on a publicly held furniture making company like Lazy Boy. Well, we're no different than anybody else, really any other industry. You know, uh, technology is disrupting a lot of, lot of industries and, you know, home furnishing is no different. I mean, mm -hmm. if you think about the internet and the e-commerce companies coming in and, and kind of disrupting everything we do. Um, you're, you're seeing that in the home furnishings uh, arena as well. Mm -hmm. Now, the great thing is we can adapt and we can and, and start doing things to help in that disruption. I always like to say we are part of the disruption as well. Um, you know, and, and it's everything from refreshing stores to new technology to manufacturing 4.0. Um, we're no different than anybody else. All industries are getting disrupted, and it's it's about whether or not you're part of the disruption. Well, and yeah, I, I well, think well, well, is a little bit. Can you play the role of disruptor as well as the disrupted? Because right. you have what did we decide the company's 94 years old? We were trying to 90, do the math. 93, 90, 93, 93 years, years old. 93 years old. I know. It's founded in 1928, right? Okay. Yes. Yeah, I know, and I'm just glad that you were doing the math on that, and not me. Um, <laughs> well, I hope I did it right. <laughs> Well, I'm sure we'll hear from the company CEO if we didn't. Um, well, you, you're like a lot of industries and in going through disruption, but not every industry uh, is or not every company is able to go out and acquire an e-commerce company, which Lazy Boy did last year with the acquisition of Joybird. Explain a little bit about how that changed your online offerings and what that was all about. Well, I mean, it was really, you know, we really wanted to be able to look at all demographics and and really provide our product to all different different age groups and different different uh, demographics. And so, if you think about it, Joybird was this upstart, great uh, e-commerce company out of LA, four years old, just doing some wonderful things, mm -hmm. you know, direct to consumer. And that was somewhere where Lazy Boy really was interested in in putting more of a footprint in. And Joybird was just that company that we thought was a good mix with us. They have great founders are great. Their product is incredible. Mm -hmm. Their customer service is uh, exemplary. And we were really thrilled to be able to have them join our team here at Lazy Boy. Okay. Well, good one. I want to talk a little bit about 
uh, how, uh, let's dive right into that, actually. It's very different corporate cultures when you've got a well-established name brand across the whole furniture landscape. Kind of everybody knows what Lazy Boy started as, anyway, and what your most famous product is. But that has got to be very different, both on the corporate and the IT side. So talk about how you manage an acquisition and transition like that as the CIO. Well, it, it's interesting because, you know, it's an e-commerce company, and mm -hmm. so we got we got to get to know the the, uh, the Joybird team pretty well, and it's really looking at their systems, looking at our systems, how can we integrate those systems, and it really, but the system part is kind of the easy part, right? If you think yeah, about technology is easy. People are hard. <laughs> it's the, right? It's yeah. the people part, and it's, and it's how do we merge those two cultures, um, and how do we, how do we start re respecting kind of the different styles of work. Mm -hmm. And I think Joybird's come a long way and I think we're gonna come a long way. We're, you know, they're four years old, but we're gonna learn a lot from them. Yeah. And, and equally, they're gonna learn a lot from us too. Mm -hmm. Well, the your IT staff, you've got about 130 people in IT and you right. kind of do everything from soup to nuts internally. What's the situation now with the Joybird acquisition? Will you end up with more that you're doing with third parties or how does that change? Cause I, I don't imagine they had more than a hundred people on their IT staff. Right, right, yeah. right. And we're really trying to, we're, we're letting Joybird kind of, you know, um, we're integrating with them. We're letting them do their thing because they have this kind of unique culture. Um, I would think that, you know, as we get to go down a little bit farther down this path, we'll decide whether or not how that all looks in the future. Mm -hmm. Again, they're creative, they're smart. They have great products. So how do we balance that? How do we work closely with them? Um, and I suspect it'll be a hybrid model, just like here at Lazy Boy. We have a hybrid model here. Yeah. We're mostly do everything from A to Z, really. But uh, we rely heavily on our partners, too. I, I always like to say that, you know, we have a good team, and our team includes all of our partners. Yeah. Um, I don't call them vendors. I call them partners because they, we can't really do what we do every day without them. And so... Yeah. Uh, we're fortunate for that, and I think as we go down this path with Joy, we'll, we'll see the same hybrid approach. Mm -hmm. I know, because I think one of the big challenges for a very large, well-established company is not to bigfoot the new acquisition. Right. Um, right. Right. The Well, and the CEO mentioned this Lazy Boy acquisition in one of his recent pre his press release about this last year and talked about the multifaceted e-commerce strategy that Lazy Boy has underway. So it involves a lot more than acquiring Joybird. Um, which for people that don't know it, they do mid-century modern furniture, but their biggest customer base is millennials. That's right. Yes. That's right. And, it, and it's nostalgia's really a... back, huh? Yeah, yeah that's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So when you think about that multifaceted e-commerce strategy, uh, talk a little bit more about what else you've been doing because digital transformation is uh, always a long, it, it is a long play. It's not just a couple of short-term changes that you're making. So uh, fill us in on what your e-commerce strategy is. Well, really, it, it's, it's, we have a multifaceted strategy. And I, I'm going to take a step back to talk a little bit about what we did with what I call the IT reinvention. Good. If that's all right. That's yeah, we, we um, you know, I joined the company a little over two years ago. And one of the things we really needed to focus on kind of was you know, we really were good at we were really good at technology. We mm -hmm. could do technology really well. We had yeah. just implemented we just implemented ERP. What we needed to really do was we really needed to start focus on how do we provide great customer service mm -hmm. from the IT area as well. And so we decided that that's where we're going to go. And we did a whole I didn't call it an IT reorganization, I called it an IT reinvention because I wanted to fundamentally change the way we were going to do IT here at Lazy Boy. Mm -hmm. And so we did that. And that really was all about structure, talent, um, how we're going to use data, how mm -hmm. we're going to have an e-commerce strategy, you know, all of those things kind of combined to help put us on a path for success going forward. Because all companies are using IT now, and we believe that IT is going to be something that not only enables success in the future, but is also going to really push forward innovation. Okay. Well, we got a question from one of our live viewers out there. Uh, what are some examples of the latest innovations being implemented in Lazy Boy products? So there's a few. So, 
you know, if you if you were to look at Lazy Boy Furniture now, and I encourage you all to go into our stores, <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, you know, you'd see, you know, we have USBs, we have, you know, you can charge your phones, you know, just by putting them on there on the on the um, on the product. Sometimes we have wireless wands, um, wireless hand uh, wands, which are awesome, uh, and that's kind of in the product. Now, if you start thinking about what we're doing in our stores and things like that, that's a little different. Yeah. I mean, if you're thinking about, you know, virtual reality, augmented reality in our mobile app, those mm-hmm. are the kind of things that people are using nowadays to really visualize what the, what our product will look like in your, in your home. Mm-hmm. And uh, really that's what we want to do. We want to turn houses into homes. Well, and you're doing that. Um, I knew you'd get that tagline in there. It's a, it's a really <laughs> nice one. <laughs> <clears throat> You're using VR and AR technologies on tablets, and that actually allows you to design an entire home and put in the products you like most and all that. Now, and you can change it on the fly. It's something that's free to people that walk into the store, and yeah. but you've already seen a big revenue upside from that. Well, we've only had launched the VR in a couple stores so far, and okay. we're, we're, on a, we're on a plan to do more. Yeah. Um, but if you can think about that, the virtual reality – uh, we have this incredible in-home design program. And when mm-hmm. you go into our stores, you'll want to, we, we have these very, very talented associates there, very talented designers who will sit down with you and talk to you about what is your vision for your home yeah. and how do we help you do that? And in a couple of our stores, we've, we've launched uh, virtual reality so you can actually see it. Now, mm-hmm. our, our, our designers will talk you through it. Help, you'll, you'll tell them your vision. They'll help draw it up, and then they can put it in a virtual reality so you can actually stand in your room. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really, really neat. I've done it myself, and it's just it's great technology. Now, in the augmented reality, you can actually go on our mobile app, and, and you can go on there, and you can you can actually, standing in your own room, put that product in your room, how you would look at it through the augmented reality on your device. Neat. That's really kind of cool, too. Yeah. And, and the thing is, we know people have these technologies at home now. Yes. So how do we – how do we – bridge the gap of coming into our store, working with our in-home designers, but also using technology because we know everybody is looking at home. They're on their tablets. They're on their laptops. Mm-hmm. They're looking at products. They're seeing what what's appealing to them. And then it's our job to, to help them figure that out. Yeah. And I think our team does a really good job doing that. Well, that uh, thank you. That was, a, that was a great question from our live network. We appreciate that, and please keep them coming. And um, this is also a really nice segue into talking a little bit more about customer expectations and how they're changing. So I believe you told me your average customer is basically a mom and a dad of – of millennials, so a 55-year-old person is your average customer, but that consumer expectations are pretty much changing alongside the younger generations as well. So talk a little bit more about that and anything significant that either you have going on from a technology perspective or just what your feelings are about how the market is changing. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, customer expectations are changing in, in almost every industry because that we have information at our fingertips now. It's so easy to get information on what we want, mm-hmm. what we need. Um, and even even better than that is just get information on stuff you don't know. And so the, the ability to get online and look at something that's really appealing to you is what we have to well, we have to harness that, right? And we have to work with our work with our, our clients and our customers um, so that they can they can have a great experience. And that isn't that what we all want? I mean, yes. really, very <laughs> friend, we all want a great experience. And so, and so how do we do that? And I think, you know, by, by knowing that that technology is in their homes, how do you balance that with the technology in our stores? Yes. So it's the in-home, but it's not just technology. It's really when I talked about that in-home design, it's, those, it's our sales associates, it's mm-hmm. our designers. It's them having the technology in their hands too, like iPad or 3D room planners. Mm-hmm or virtual reality or augmented reality to allow for them to really enhance that experience, that customer experience with our, with our customers and our clients as they walk through our door. Because we know they're at home researching. Yes. And so how do we make that experience even better for them? And, you know, it, it's, it's all different ages. We can do that with all different ages. And, mm-hmm. and that's why it's so great to have a joy bird, a lazy boy, and our, and our, and our other, other partners as well. Yeah. 
Well, and I, you'd mentioned that with the in-home design and the tablets and the technology, there's a pretty huge percentage of people that actually do buy more when they engage with a designer. And it's that yeah. that face-to-face -face human engagement that, um, I don't know, I, I tend to look at that with a certain amount of relief because I, I still like this conversation here. I mean, we're using technology to have a face-to-face -face conversation in a way. <laughs> That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And it's just, it's better. You just get more information. You get more anecdotes. Um, let me see. I'll take a pause now and uh, welcome any of our new viewers. I'm Mary Fran Johnson. I'm the host of CIO Leadership Live, and I'm here talking with David Bayen, who is the Vice President and Chief Information Officer at Lazy Boy. Let's talk uh, next about some of your top business and technology initiatives in the coming year. You mentioned your IT reinvention, which you undertook a year ago, and that you felt like you needed a hard look at what IT needed to be in the future, and that involved skill set changes, things that you yeah. either needed to upgrade or bring into the company. Um, talk about that for us. So, yeah, I mean, we have really talented people here at Lazy Boy, and what I wanted to make sure that we were doing here at Lazy Boy is that we were not only implementing technology really well, but we were also helping our business customers understand how they can use technology to really, you know, improve or enhance our business. Mm -hmm. And so a couple of things come with that. It, you can be really technical and that's good, but I was really also looking for, and I'm blessed here at Lazy Boy, like I said, with a great team. I really wanted people to be able to manage, I call them leadership management and coaching skills. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to, I want someone who can lead other people, lead projects, manage projects. I want people who can manage budgets, um, mm -hmm. manage themselves, manage their teams. And I'm also looking for people to, to coach others, to make mm -hmm. each other better in their job. And coaching is a really important part of that. And so I, I really push coaching, but also I really want a whole team with a skill set of communication. You know, I don't know about you, but I've never been yelled at by somebody. Uh, no one's ever called me up and yelled at me because I haven't communicated. I communicated too much to them. You know, I, no one's ever said, "Hey, stop communicating with me." But I have had people and customers call up and say, I, "You're not communicating well." So I really, I tell my team all the time to over communicate. Mm -hmm. And as we go, we, we're going to start some big projects here. We're, we have some kind of things we have to do in the future, and you know, you're going to make mistakes. And, but if you communicate, you communicate really well, mm -hmm. you get through those things. And yeah. so, um, you know, that's kind of the skill set I was looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, again, blessed with some really smart people here. And how do we enhance the skill set of leadership management coaching? Yeah. Those are things I'm looking for. Well, it's funny, as you were talking about uh, never getting yelled at for over communicating, I can remember in grade school having a lot of issues with teachers over talking too much in class. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I always I want to drop them a note now and say, see, it turned out that all that talking was actually a way to make a living. You know? That's right. <laughs> Maybe what we need to do is mentor partnership, uh, an extrovert with an introvert. Because I'm always telling people extroverts think out loud and they think before they speak, so that we're processing and thinking out loud, and introverts tend to think before they speak, so they're processing stuff internally. And we see this at a lot of our CIO events where 96% of the people in the room are introverts, and they know they're there to network and socialize with each other, but it's not their favorite thing to do. But right. if you have someone nagging at them from the stage and encouraging them to, like, turn and say hello to the person next to you, it breaks the ice. It gets people chatting. I think the same is true with IT groups. If you get – everybody has stories to tell. And if you get them connected with each other and telling those stories, I think it's a, it's a great move. We have another question from our audience. You are, you are batting a 1,000 so far. We've had some of these episodes in the past where we didn't get a single question from anybody. But now that we're streaming on LinkedIn, in. We're actually getting a lot more engagement with our audience. How did you convince your CEO on tech investment? How do you relate that to shareholder value? Now, well, yeah. So I will say this: it didn't take a lot. Uh, Kurt Darrow's an amazing CEO. Mm -hmm. um, he has been the CEO for 15 plus years here at Lazy Boy, and he's led this company through uh, some challenges, and he's led us through good times. And and Kurt. It didn't take a lot of convincing with Kurt. I mean, Kurt understands uh, what technology can do for the company. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, and, and if you think about Lazy Boy, Lazy Boy owns the process from A to Z. We, ma we make all our own product. 
we house and distribute our own product and we have stores that we sell it in. So we kind of have this A to Z process, right? Yes. And Kurt understands the value of technology. The thing that Kurt's really, really good at too is he, he can see what technology can do for the business. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say that we're a fast follower company. You know, we're not going to be on the cutting edge. Um, we're just not going to do that. We're going to we're going to let others kind of kind of try it out. It gets called learn. the bleeding edge for a reason, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we'll learn from their mistakes, mm-hmm. and then we'll implement that technology in a real close partnership with our business partners, all my business verticals. Yeah. And so we just see technology as an enabler for success. Yeah. And I think that's I think that's where Kurt. You know, it doesn't take a lot of convincing with Kurt. He mm-hmm. challenges me. He challenges the rest mm-hmm. of the team here, but um, he's just a really, really good, great CEO. Yeah. Well, it, and that's wonderful to hear. I think all CIOs should be blessed with CEOs with this kind yeah, of attitude. Um, but if you're doing any sort of innovation and experimentation with technology, inevitably there will be some failures where that you have to move forward quickly from and that sort of thing. Right. How, do you have any examples of that yet? Or do you have a, a way that you know you'll deal with it when you inevitably encounter one of those things where you try something but it doesn't work so well? We haven't had anything like that yet here. Mm-hmm. Um, but I will say over the past couple of years, we've pushed the envelope on some of the technology we're pushing. Again, fast followers, not mm-hmm. not bleeding edge. But, you know, if you think about robotic process automation, yes. we'll be implementing that very soon. Um, where we'll have some bots doing some of our some of our um, some of our processes. And I think you're going to see I think, you know, I think the benefits realization we're going to see is we're going to see a cost savings there. and We're going to see some value to the company. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, those are kind of things that. You know, that takes some risk because uh, it's new to, to a company. Mm-hmm. And so um, we'll see soon how, how that works. <laughs> and there's some other things that we're doing that we'll see soon how it works. But, I, you know, again, I think, you know, under Kurt's leadership and with, the, you know, our, our, our executive team here, there's a lot of folks. There's a lot of um, patience. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of there's a, there is an attitude for some risk taking, too. So Good. So that appetite is there. Yes. Okay, great. It's, it's wonderful when it is there, um, especially if you can remind them of that when something does go a little bit wrong. <laughs> That's what you need. You're like, remember how you, you folks were all on board with this. Um, we have another question for you, and I know this one is very near and dear to your heart, about attracting and retaining talent and how you balance outsourcing needs with outsourcing and insourcing. It doesn't sound like you've ever really needed to insource any processes because you haven't done that much outsourcing yet. Right. But that question about attracting and retaining talent, uh, you are uh, some uh, an hour south of Detroit, an hour, 20 we're minutes? Less than an hour. Less, less than, than an hour. South of Detroit. But I, like to tell pe- yep. I like to tell people we're, we're between, we're, we're a little bit, of, about 40 minutes from Detroit and about 40 minutes of, from Ann Arbor. Okay. Uh, Yep. All right. And, uh, Not a know, vacation is, hot spot. So how do you get <laughs> how do you get well, people? You know, it, how do you get your talent in Michigan? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Um, first of all, Michigan's a great state. And if you live here, you know, yep. I'm welcome you all to come visit us at Lazy Boy. How's That's right. That? I know. I we'll show great. you our snow blowers that are parked in we our have, garage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We have an absolute world class world headquarters. I'm proud to show anybody. But yep. really the talent um and retention, it, it it's interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh you know, I like to have a hybrid approach to my IT organization. Mm-hmm. I think there's really strategic things that we need to keep internal with my team working on um, that are just near and dear to, to, to moving the company forward. And then I believe we also need partners to help us with things that, quite frankly, they're just better than at it, better mm-hmm. at it than us. And so that's why I really have the strong hybrid approach. I, t- I look at that also with talent. I really believe the strongest organizations are the organizations that have folks who are maybe in the second half of their career, at the twilight of their career, mm-hmm. and then bringing in folks who are just starting, fresh out of school, fresh out of the, fresh out of, uh, fresh into their new career. Mm-hmm. So I think that that mix is yeah. really incredible. I think you have reverse mentoring happening all the time, which is mm-hmm. awesome. You have real met, you have the normal mentoring going on all the time, mm-hmm. and there's that balance of Here's how we used to do it, mm-hmm. and we've been very successful. And then here's how we how you can do it now. Yeah. And it it, it creates this I call it creative tension, 
mm -hmm. that allows for us to do some really good things. Now, we, we are in close proximity to Detroit and Ann Arbor, and that helps. Detroit's a hotbed for technology. Ann yes. Arbor is too. Yes. And we're lucky. We can, because of our brand, Lazy Boy's got a great brand name, mm -hmm. iconic brand. Mm -hmm. And our, we have a great HR team that helps us kind of uh, recruit. And I'm not shameless. I'll call my old CIO friends and say to them, mm -hmm. hey, I'm looking for this position. How can you help me with that? Yeah. And uh, so the, ta the, the talent is critical. We have a pretty good retention uh, rate here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we we have a good tuition reimbursement program. Okay. Uh, you know, there's things that we put in place that I think allows for us to recruit pretty well. Um, again, we're not cutting edge. We're not bleeding edge. Mm -hmm. We're fast followers with a great brand name with a great balance of a hybrid organ hybrid IT organization. Well, it was interesting watching, I know uh, last year at our CIO 100 event, I had um, Randy Mott on stage talking about yeah. uh, G GM and the way they set up the four data centers around. They set them up in parts of the country that within a 100-mile radius had all kinds of universities and uh, yeah. training facilities and that sort of thing. And it wasn't about trying to set up in downtown LA or, you know, like, or Silicon Valley, someplace like, you know, that is, is, is reportedly super cool. It actually had more to do with uh, a lot of other, a lot of other life issues, which I seem to be very important, more important even so to millennials than I remember them being for my generation. Yeah. And we're blessed here too. We have the University of Michigan, Wayne State University, yeah. University of Toledo, Eastern Michigan University. We have in many great community colleges around us too. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I failed to mention that I think has really helped us in retention and attracting talents, we have an incredible internship program. Where we have juniors you. and seniors in college come you. in yeah. and we really, we give them real work. Mm -hmm. It's not the kind of, you know, they, you know, they come in and we put them on a project. They may be leading the project and we were give them real work and, and we, we make it fun for them too. Mm -hmm. We bring them here. We make them have a lot of fun because work not having fun, you know, you're not really doing it right. And uh, so we have a lot of little programs in place that allow for, for us to be really pretty good with our talent retention. Excellent, excellent. You mentioned earlier, um, just sort of in passing, manufacturing 4.0. And I wanted yeah. to explore that a little further for all of us who are not in the manufacturing sector. What do you mean when you say that? And what has Lazy Boy been doing in that realm? Well, technology, of course, in every industry is taking hold mm -hmm. and obviously, right? And, and manufacturing 4.0 is what is that next? What's industry 4.0? What's next for us? And, you know, we're looking at things like IoT, you know, Internet of Things mm -hmm. in our plants, mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to measure to, uh, to, to measure data, to measure weights, you know, to just give us really good data on how we're doing things in our plants. We have some robotics in our plants, but not a lot. You know, we're a customized business. We have incredible, we call them industrial athletes. Mm -hmm. And they're absolutely incredible what they do. We have a world-class manufacturing organization led by Daryl Edwards. And the, the folks there are just incredible as they put together our customized product. But technology, you know, everything from visualization of having screens to really highlight the, the fabric and the, the fabric for that product to ensure we're doing it correctly, you know, mm -hmm. picking the right one because we have so many to IoT, to more advanced manufacturing. Um, those are, we're doing a lot of things in that area. And, and we think that is a competitive advantage for us too. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, now that's, again, it's a merger. Again, it's that hybrid approach between industrial athletes Yes. Actually doing the work and bringing in some technology to enhance that and allow for them to be successful. Mm -hmm. Do you, one of the things that I know gets talked about in that realm is the convergence going on between um, IT and operational technology, the shop floor and the factory floor stuff. And there are uh, some CIOs that are now taking on both worlds. Are you, how, do, how are you managing that at Lazy Boy? And is that something that you, is, is a next step for you as the CIO of Lazy Boy to be in charge of all of that as well? Well, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, we, we are approaching it as a partnership with our supply chain team. Okay. Um, you know, we bring it, it, and it's great. We have, we, we're very connected to our supply chain, I mean, to our manufacturing teams. And the fact that 
we, we look at them as part of our team. We look at them as part of their team. Mm -hmm. And so we're looking at advanced technologies with them, but we also got to keep in mind that they're doing the, that they're doing the manufacturing. They know the expertise of the manufacturing world. We're the expertise when it comes to it. Mm -hmm. So how do you merge those two together? And that's been a challenge for it. That's been a challenge for forever. Yes. But uh, you know, with the talent we have here, I think we're being pretty successful with that right now. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, there may be a lot of people who are watching this right now who are thinking either in Michigan or thinking about a move to Michigan because we have another <laughs> IT skill set question about what IT skill sets do you really need to keep in-house and what are the ones that you're more willing to outsource or perhaps out of need for greater expertise would outsource? So, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. It's a great question. Uh, mm -hmm. So think about security, cybersecurity. That's something very near and dear to me, and I've had a lot of experience in that. Um, we want to have a, a really sharp, committed IT security team here at Lazy Boy. Mm -hmm. Now, I say that we're going to have some of those folks in-house, and we're going to have them doing everything that we need to do from a security perspective in-house. But it does also leverage, I do have the leverage to also have a hybrid approach there if you think about the, the monitoring overnight, the 24-7 yeah. monitoring. That lends itself to a real good hybrid approach and a partnership. Um, With a company so really that is at, a company that's more devoted to doing that as their full-time offering. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. You know, and then you think you can think about the ERP, right? Yes. And think about that's such a lifeblood to our company mm -hmm. that there's going to be certain things in the ERP that we are never going to outsource. That we're never going to find a partner for. Right. But there might be aspects of it that can. It's mm -hmm. almost like a, a cloud first strategy too. Yeah. I look at our cloud first strategy as I'm not asking my team to put everything in the cloud, mm -hmm. but I am asking them as we do new initiatives to take a look at the cloud. Yes. And will that make sense for us to do that? Does that, does, how does that benefit the company? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I do look at each kind of different scenario about whether or not I keep it in house or I, I farm it out. You know, another example would be project management. Mm -hmm. We really believe in you got to have strong project management in IT. Um, in the, and in the company. And so I really focus on hiring very strong certified project managers here at Lazy. Yeah. Well, uh, so that they can run those projects. You'd also mentioned yeah. that one of the skill sets you created was um, a business relationship manager. Yeah. And yeah. that seems like another kind of job that would be very difficult to outsource. Yeah, that one's really, you can't. That, one, <laughs> that one's got to be. In, it's in, got to be source. face to face. Yeah. Because that's a really important role for us. That was a role that we brought in a couple years ago. Because it's really important as we looked at who, how we partner with our businesses and our verticals, I needed somebody who could go in there, understand their business really, really well, mm -hmm. and then come and advocate for technology with the business and help, help uh, vision, sh have a shared vision with them. But then also the role is to advocate for that vertical with IT. They come back and argue with us about, right. yeah, IT is really important in this area and we need to do it for them and, and then do the pros and cons with us. So that business relationship manager role is really critical. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, and one of the other, um, you mentioned this as a, a big business initiative you have going on, although it's tech-based, about robo uh, robotics process automation, RPA, in the finance area. Yeah. Can you tell me more about that, what that actually means? Yeah, so we're looking at some of our processes and our kind of our back office, not just finance, but some other areas. We're looking at our back office and we're looking at how can how can technology, you know, if you look at that process, if you streamline that process, and maybe we can put some some technology on that process called robotics process automation mm -hmm. um, to actually streamline the process, reduce the cost of doing it. Um, and we're going to, I firmly believe we're going to see that take off a little bit. We're going to start out in some of our areas in finance. We're going to streamline that. We're going to put in some of the, what they would call bots, and we're going to see how that works. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Well, that's the kind of sort of an innovative mindset that you really need today as a CIO, that testing things out. Yeah, and it, you know, yeah. it's, it's a little bit of a risk, mm -hmm. uh, it's, and it makes it, it's change. And yeah. I said earlier, the technology is easy. It's it's the people and change management that's going to be a challenge. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But, uh, we, have a, we have great partners in finance, and so I'm, I'm I'm pretty excited about it. Yeah. 
the um, well, if you are just if you're joining us late in the show, this is CIO Leadership Live. I'm the host, Mary Fran Johnson, and I'm here talking with our the vice president and CIO of Lazy Boy, uh, based in Monroe, Michigan. Am I saying that yet right? Monroe? No, not really. It's Mon- Monroe. Monroe. <laughs> All right, Monroe. <laughs> you can tell I've lived in the Boston area for way too long. Right. You should hear my A's. Yeah, it is your, it's your accent. That's I, exactly what it is. I always I go around thinking I don't have an accent. And then I say things like bath. And people say, <laughs> oh, upstate New York, right? Um, let's talk about uh, strategies for learning a new industry, because you went from six years as the CIO of the state of Michigan, the master and commander of all you all you surveyed in IT, and also the chief admin. You were an, a chief administrative uh, administrative officer as well, and then you went to a, a much smaller company in the public sector, and it was kind of an unexpected move for you even in your own career plan. So talk a little bit about how that happened, how you went from CIO of the state of Michigan to Lazy Boy and why you made that kind of a jump. Yeah, so I was blessed. I got I had a great opportunity to be the CIO and the director of the Department of Technology Management and Budget for Governor Rick Snyder. I mean, mm-hmm. an awesome, incredible opportunity. I got to do things, meet people and go places that, you know, uh, I never thought I could. And so but, you know, we knew when we took those roles that in Michigan, you have term limits. So there was two four-year terms. You, mm-hmm. And I had committed to the first term, and then I stayed a little longer. So I stayed about six years. But I knew I needed to move on. And, and I was really very interested in getting back in the private sector. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I was interviewing all over the place. And uh, late, someone called me, that a friend, a, another CIO friend of mine called and said, hey, I know that Lazyboy is looking for a CIO. Are you interested? And to be honest, I said, I don't know. <laughs> I said, I'm not sure really what they do. So I have to figure that out. And uh, so they called and I started talking to them. And as luck should have it, the chief HR officer was an old friend of mine who I hadn't seen in oh. 20 years. She's the so network. She said, <laughs> she said, come on in for lunch. Yeah. So I came in for lunch and I, First, I pulled into this campus and the building is absolutely amazing. And I was thinking, I looked around and I said, hmm. this place has some innovation. Yeah. Clearly the history is innovative. They, they, you know, they started out in innovation, but clearly some cool stuff happening here. Mm-hmm. So I went and I had lunch and we were talking about it and they explained that, you know, 14 wow. years manufacturing, 15 years manufacturing or 15 years retail experience, what they're looking for. And I said, Barb, this is a beautiful lunch. I really enjoyed seeing you again. It's great catching up, but I'm probably not your guy. Yeah. Because I don't have that experience. Mm-hmm. And she said, well, we're really looking for someone to help transform our company with using technology. Hmm. We're looking for a leader. And I said, well, okay, <laughs> now maybe. But I said, still, you're still looking for all that experience. I don't have it. Yeah. And she said, just come talk to our CEO. Wow. So I came and I talked to Kurt. And uh, it just so happened that when I looked for what I was looking for, Mm-hmm. Um, I checked all the boxes yeah. and, and I really was very interested in learning something new. Um, yeah, I'd been a CIO for 14 years or whatnot, mm-hmm. but that doesn't mean I can stop learning. And so I was really interested in manufacturing. I'm mm-hmm. in Michigan, you know, that mm-hmm. we think the hotbed of manufacturing. So I was really interested. I want to learn that. And I thought retail was really interesting, really cool stuff happening. And so I thought, yeah, man, this seems like something I really could get into. And and it was, I was lucky. I was blessed. It's only 35 minutes from my home. I didn't have ah, to pick up and move my family. Nice and, commute. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it just was really interesting that I wanted to learn something new. And I always I always tell my, my kids and my friends and people who work with me that you learn the most when you're uncomfortable. Well, I can tell you... Mm-hmm. For two years, I've been uncomfortable, and I've been learning a lot from the great team here. <laughs> well, I know that uh, I, as you were finding this new role, one of the interviews that I, I read that you'd done, you you talked about things that were on your non-negotiables list, and it was an innovative company, an interesting progressive culture, and a CEO from whom you could learn the business side. Right. Now, that plays into some of your own career path interests going forward. Um I don't run into this a whole lot, but you're one of those CIOs who is very markedly interested in moving into the chief executive job at some point in your future. 
Yeah. Why I, is that? And why aren't more CIOs doing that? Because I'm crazy. No, no, <laughs> right? no. That's too easy an answer. Come on. <laughs> no, I mean, I think, you know, I've always had, I do five-year plans and, uh, you know, I've been blessed with great mentors and coaches my mm -hmm. entire career. And I've hit the majority of my five-year plans, almost all of them. Ah. And I believe that the CIO with the role we play in organizations today, which we're, we have to know almost all of the business because we have to implement technology with them. We have to communicate well because we're managing projects with them and we're thinking about innovation with the business leaders. CIOs are business leaders now. A few years ago, mm -hmm. we would probably say we were kind of the second tier, but no, we're there now driving innovation, driving projects, driving technology, driving business value. So if you look at the path to the CEO, you look at a lot of people go as CFOs, COOs, even CM, chief marketing officers as well, CMOs. Mm -hmm. I think the CIO is fresh for that as well mm -hmm. because we are learning everything about that. Now, there's things we need to do. From the business acumen, when I said I needed to learn from a CEO, Kurt was perfect. Kurt understands that I need, I want to learn about manufacturing, yeah. excuse me, about retail, mm -hmm. about those things. And he was, he was the first one to say, well, well, let's get that done for you then. How can yeah. we, how can we develop you in that way? And that was really important. to me. That's great. Well, the, and you've mentioned too, a lot of it, the importance of mentorship and advice and staying tapped into your network and all that sort of thing. How do you instill that sort of um, attitude uh, in your IT staff? I, what are some of the, the things that you're doing to make sure that they're thinking uh, in a more business-oriented fashion? Well, I, it goes back kind of to the IT reinvention, too. It's really yeah. about we're going to do – we're going to change the way we do IT fundamentally. That's really going to be focusing on customer and focusing on business. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I think that has gone through to my team. We're, we're just at the – just a little past the one-year anniversary of that IT reinvention. As a matter of fact, the next couple of days – take my IT leadership team and my IT managers off site to kind of look at um, where we were a year ago, where we are today. Mm -hmm. And I have a saying, act and adjust. So let's, uh, we've acted for a year. Now, how do we adjust? It's yeah. really engage, act, adjust. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to do that. And, and then I look at all of my direct reports. I try to get them a, a, a former CIO to be their co a coach, mm -hmm. not me. I want someone who's outside the organization giving them raw, honest feedback because I think they're learning a lot that way. And I think yeah. they can bring them that skill set back into Lazy Boy and make Lazy Boy a better place to work. That's great. Well, and I think that there is an increasing supply of former CIOs who have gone into, I had one of them tell me he wouldn't call it retirement. He's in a renewal phase, you know, where it's a, it's the next chapter in his CIO career and he's not going to be a CIO, but he's very interested in mentorship and coaching. And well, I, I think it's great because yeah. CIOs have a lot to offer. Yes. Um, and I'm, I'm a little alarmed by you saying, and you're seeing it increasingly that that, does, that doesn't mean CIOs are jumping ship too fast. No, I think it, it <laughs> may mean that I need to keep bringing younger and younger CIOs into my own network. There you go. Because <laughs> a go. lot of these are folks that I've known for 15 plus years, maybe even 20 plus years. And I, it always breaks my heart a little when I hear someone is retiring or leaving. But generally, they're not really doing that. And I had one of them who sent a note and he said, this isn't retirement. This is renewal. And here's yeah, what I'm going to be doing next. And absolutely. I know a couple of CIOs who have gone on to become consultants, but then within a year, they end up in a chief operating officer or a CEO role. Uh, and you and I in uh, New York uh, last April were on stage with one of those CIOs to CEO kind of positions. So I think that that's a very important direction uh, and, and a very viable one for CIOs in their careers. Which uh, last thing I will ask you before we wrap up, what is the, if you had to, and this is one of those axe in the forehead lightning round questions, uh, your best advice for would-be CIOs, but you have to boil it down to like three biggest pieces of advice. All right, so I'll give it three. Give it three. One is, absolutely, you're a CIO, you're at the, you're at the strategy table, you're an executive in your company, mm -hmm. be a leader. Yeah. Be a leader. Don't, don't, don't stand back. You know, it's, it's your opportunity now to become a leader and be a leader. Second one is be a great communicator. Again, I said earlier in the talk today, you know, no one's going to yell at you 
if you over, no one ever yells at you when you over communicate, but they certain, certain heck will give you a hard time if you're not communicating with them. And then finally, and this is one I always, I always tell people, don't take yourself so seriously. I notice a lot of times CIOs are very serious, mm -hmm. um, very business, it's, very, you it's know. It's hard to get them serious. to crack up or smile. It is. Have fun, <laughs> you know, have fun because I think we all have stressful jobs. Yeah. And when you're at the executive level and you're a CIO, it's stressful. But you want to make sure you have a fun atmosphere at work. You want to make sure that you are um, instilling that culture in your in your team, mm -hmm. and just don't take yourself so seriously. You know. Okay, I right? think that that's great advice, and you're saying that with a smile on your face, which is really important. <laughs> and we have one final. We're going to do one bonus question round here, uh, and it comes back again to the IT staff and employees. And the question is, how much time should CIOs give or allow to employees to adapt and reskill themselves to things like new technology, such as cloud, before you go outside to acquire new talents? It's, I guess it's, yeah. in a way, it's a question about how much patience uh, do you yeah. have for that? Well, it depends on the company you're at and the organization. And I believe that when you hire somebody, you, you, when you team up with somebody, they come on your team, you have an obligation to give them the, I think the role is as a CIO is to give them the knowledge, skills, tools, and resources to do their job. Mm -hmm. And then you give them a good amount of time to do that. Now, um, you can make mistakes. Absolutely. You want them to make mistakes. You want them to fail fast, but you don't want them to fail fast multiple times. Right. So there is that, yeah. there is that development piece. There's that accountability piece, but I think it's incumbent upon you to make sure what's that right balance. And then when you bring them on your team, invest in them so that they can be successful because if they are successful, you are successful and your company is going to be successful. Excellent. Very good answer. Thank you well, so thank much you. for all your time today. It's always great to talk with you, David, and I'm, yeah, I'm sure we'll do much more of it in the future as well. If you joined us late for CIO Leadership Live, you can watch the full episode later today on CIO.com or on YouTube, where uh, we also, and audio podcasts of the show, are basically streamed to wherever you get your podcasts. Please join me for our next episode, which will be streamed live on LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube on Wednesday, November 6th at 2 p.m. Eastern. And that day I'll be joined by John McGuthrie. We'll be hearing from a higher ed CIO because John is the CIO at Cal Poly Pomona out in California. I also urge you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is called IDG Tech Talk, and you can find all of the previous episodes of CIO Leadership Live. Thanks so much for being with us today, and I hope you'll join us again next time. Take care.